Hello friend, this is Brent Winfield welcoming you to another edition of I Didn't Know That. Have you been enjoying these video letters? You have? Great. As always, I invite you to write me with your questions and comments. I also invite you to visit the adventmessage.com website and share with this great resource uh, with your friends and family. One day in 1899, a man stepped off a streetcar in New York City and was struck and killed by a horseless carriage. That first traffic fatality marked the beginning of a carnage which now annually exceeds by far the victims of two world wars. In one year alone, twice as many Americans were injured in automobile accidents as were wounded in five years of World War II, which was really our bloodiest war to date. If Americans' $11 billion annual economic loss from traffic accidents were to spread equally, each family would get just a bill of $208. These alarming statistics of slaughter in the highways constitute only a part of the overall picture of physical loss and suffering which afflicts our 20th century like an incurable plague. In spite of tremendous advances in medical research and new discoveries for prolonging human life, the fact remains that one out of eight Americans will be in a hospital patient during this year. North Americans are not a nation of healthy citizens by any means. At least 75 million Americans have chronic illnesses of smaller or greater degree. That is more than a third of our total population. A survey was taken some years ago in an American city where 156 questions were asked every inhabitant it was discovered that the prime interest of adults was of health, not politics, not history, or even the weather, but health. Their health and the health of their families. What a paradoxical age is this one in which we live. A time when we have more doctors, hospitals, medicines, more medical knowledge of the care, treatment, and cure of disease, more pills, capsules, vitamins, and so forth. Yet never has there been a time when more sickness and general ill health has plagued the human heart. Millions are suffering from the side effects of wrong living habits and harmful eating and drinking. We live in a world which is shattered by pain. The cries of the sick and disease are the trademarks of modern society. In spite of incredible progress in medical research, the problems of health and longevity are still the most serious of our society faces. Why can't disease be entirely eliminated, friends? Is it God's will for cancer to continue its malignant growth in the obituary columns of our, of our country? It is a fact that many diseases have been conquered and eliminated. Yet others seem to break out in an unpredictable pattern to replace those which were eradicated. Now here's what the Bible says concerning this matter. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. 3 John verse 2 It seems a little strange that one of the most deadly diseases continues to rampage and destroy life with increasing force. I'm talking about cancer, of course, which continues to increase as a killer of every age group. I'm not going to dwell on the well-known facts of lung cancer, which destroys more than 60,000 people every year. Suffice it to say that this deadly statistic would be almost entirely eliminated if the American public had the simple moral purpose and strength to quit smoking cigarettes. Should time last and should America change its course soon enough to survive, future generations will probably look back on this mass suicide smoking age as the most unbelievable in world history. Probably there has never been a period since time began when so many people with such full knowledge of what they're doing followed a, a course of self-destruction. When life seems so little that a person prefers to smoke and die rather than live, we're far along the road which ancient Rome followed before us. This cancer smoking picture is more than a physical dilemma for those who choose lingering pain and death. It is also a moral problem. God's word says 
in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know you not that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now please notice, friend, that those who defile and destroy their own bodies are sinning against God and will be punished for that sin by being destroyed. There is no question about this point. The Bible speaks with clarity and conviction. If human language has any meaning at all, we can understand the Word of God on this. In the Old Testament, God often accused His people of being destroyed for lack of knowledge and held them guilty of not searching to know the truth. But friend, today we face a situation that is far worse. What must the God of heaven think as he looks down on an indulgent generation of weak-willed transgressors of their own bodies who don't have a perfect knowledge of what they're doing, and yet they do it? With all the terrifying facts of lung cancer before them, millions continue to invite death by the dubious pleasure of burning out their lungs. Why do they do it? This is the question that goes begging for an answer. The amazing fact is that this soft generation prefers to indulge its perverted appetite than to exert the effort and will to curb any fleshly pleasures. Even the lingering torment of death will be the result. One of the strangest paradoxes of American life is found in this area of health. Though people fear sickness above every other enemy, yet they do almost nothing about taking care of their health until after disease has already struck. In a year's time, out of every medical dollar spent by the North American people, 95 cents was spent to get well, and 5 cents was spent on preventative medicine. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But in this field, most people seem to, be, seem to excel in reason or good sense anyway. A group of tourists in Spain had gone to visit one of the historic sites. Up on the side of a cliff, there was an ancient monastery which they wanted to visit. After they had toured the monastery, they were being lured back down the side of the cliff. Now, the only way to get up there was in a basket which was pulled over the, the pulley by some of the monks in the, in the monastery. As they were getting into the basket to be lured back down, they noticed that the rope was rather frayed. So they asked the monk in charge, How often do you change the rope? And the monk said, well, we change it every time it breaks, of course. Now, that wasn't much comfort to those who were being lowered down in the basket. You see, the care and control of one's body requires self-discipline and self-denial. These characteristics aren't very popular in the soft, materialistic world that we have inherited. Friend, perhaps you haven't realized it before, but there is a marvelous relationship between good health and good religion. A sick, weakened body can't really give full, true service to God and His commandments. But do we realize that human body and systems are exactly the same as they have been for thousands of years? Also, the basic flaws, the basic laws of our being uh, unchanged for generations. Doctors, drugs, and diseases may change drastically as time goes along, but the human machine is essentially the same as when God made it at the very beginning of human history. The laws which govern our health are permanent and unchanging. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is merely repeating an eternal truth which applies to every age and every people. The practices which kept Grandpa healthy will doubtless be good for us. And by the way, some of the more simple and natural remedies are still recognized as being the most effective, like fresh air, exercise, plenty of water, lots of sleep and relaxation. These are standard prescriptions for modern physicians, just as they, they were a generation ago. Unfortunately, under the 20th century scheme of things, people will not slow down to enjoy the benefits of those reliable remedies. Medical doctors also seem to find it easier and faster to just give an injection or a pill instead of utilizing some of those longer treatments 
more in line with nature's operation. Now, don't misunderstand me, friend. There is certainly a need for every new medical aid to combat disease. But there remains a lingering question that we are depending too much on drug medication, instead of the slower but more genuine benefits of natural therapy. If the preventative practices of good living habits could be used against illness, many of the emergency drug medications would never be needed today. But let's consider another aspect of the cancer problem. Even with the astronomical rise of lung cancer, the fact remains that a third of all cancers of the human body occur within the stomach, and half of all the cancers are found in the organs of digestion including the liver, pancreas, small intestine, and colon. Friend, the reason for this cancer concentration must be obvious to all of us. Except for those who bombard their lungs with hot tobacco tars, the stomach is the most abused organ of the body. Dr. James Wing, one of the founders of the American Cancer Society, made this statement in a tract entitled, The Prevention of Cancer. He said, The perpetual abuse of a normal stomach frequently gives rise to cancer and an abnormally weak stomach may suffer the same fate from less abuse. In both instances, abuse and overfunction must be regarded as the exciting cause. End of quote. You see, the, the, the stomach is not lined with, with copper. It's a delicate organ. The sole safe conclusion to be drawn from these data is that all forms of abuse of the stomach must be avoided if the high mortality from this very common disease of cancer is to be reduced. It is simply hair-raising and blood-curdling to see what goes into the stomach of a North American man or woman, and even the children. The greatest test seems to be whether it tastes good or else whether it gives a pleasant after-effect. No wonder 50% of the population is suffering from obesity and 300 million is spent each year on diet formulas and exercise gadgets. The amazing fact is the average American consumes 1,400 pounds of food every year. This is undoubtedly a large factor in the 1.5 million patients who fill American hospitals every day of the year. Have you ever noticed that the three-fifths of the word death is eat? Now let's turn our attention upon something more alarming. In the U.S. alone, more than 60 people commit suicide each day. The most popular of these three methods of suicide are shooting, poison, and hanging. But millions more are committing suicide by a slower but more effective method. Each time they walk to the dinner table, they take one step closer to the grave. Now this is why it's impossible to separate diet from the total picture of health. Millions of people are almost literally digging their graves with their fork and teeth. Poor habits of eating and drinking account for a large portion of deaths and disabilities in this modern age. But how much does the average individual know about this, his own body and how to take care of it? Doesn't it seem strange to you that the average parent knows more about the physical needs of the chickens in the pen or a dog in the house than he does about the needs of his own children? The average man knows more about the needs of his automobile than he does about the physical needs of his own child. Why is there such an incredible amount of ignorance concerning the way to take care of this sacred body temple? We believe that the human body is sacred and has been created for a purpose. It is to be taken care of, preserved, and maintained according to the specific rules and health principles. The trouble is that most North Americans simply follow their appetite in matters of eating and drinking. Very few human beings are willing to exercise a measure of self-control and self-denial when it comes to the indulgences of the flesh. Every one of us has been born with a depraved appetite. We cannot help ourselves on that. It is a part of our human nature. That is the reason a baby will eat dirt or trash or roaches or pins or whatever he can get his hands on. But friend, 
when we come to the age of accountability and responsibility, we should be able to curb and control our appetite and our physical cravings so that we conform to the rules and regulations of God. Now you may be asking, Brent, does the Bible really have something to say about what we ought to eat and drink? Well, my friend, if there is any relationship at all between good health and religion, then the Bible should certainly be concerned with this question. Now listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now let's read a text that will forever settle whether or not our health is a spiritual matter. We referred to it already. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What a solemn thought this presents. Our bodies are not really our own. We belong to God. His Holy Spirit is to inhabit these body temples, and we must preserve them for that purpose. Some people are saying that it doesn't make any difference how they take care of themselves. They feel that their body is their own, and they can deal with it as they please. That really doesn't make much sense when you analyze it. To me, it would be just as foolish for you to be flying with a pilot friend, let's say over the mountains of North Carolina, and look down at the gauges on the panel and say, well, it looks that like you're about to run out of oil and gas, but it doesn't make a bit of difference, I suppose. The fact is, it would scare you to death. Now, if that pilot landed at the airport and told the man to put some coal oil into the high compression engine and use oil in the crankcase, how far would you ride with that pilot after that? Now listen. There's a manual that goes with this body of ours, just like a plane has a maintenance manual. If God tells you to burn 100 aviation octane, don't try to get 80. If he tells you to be careful about overindulging the body with rich foods and not being gluttonous, then you'd better pay attention to that also. The man who puts salt water in the radiator or sand in the crankcase is a fool, but not any bigger fool than the man who will put alcohol, dirt, or much rich food in his human system. I'm sure you can see how foolish it is for a man to drive into a service station and ask for the best permanent antifreeze to put in his radiator and then go next door and get a bottle of liquor and put it into his human system to enter the delicate lining of his stomach, and then to pass through the bloodstream to the liver to begin the cirrhosis of the liver and paralysis of the brain. And yet thousands and thousands of people are doing that very thing. Millions of them are doing it, in fact. They seem to have no concept whatsoever of how to take care of the delicately balanced body that can be so easily destroyed. North American people are sort of like the little bird when the mama bird comes home. He just throws his mouth wide open and apparently it doesn't make any difference whether the, a beetle or a bumblebee goes down his throat. The cook stove is a murderer in most homes and after our foods are poisoned, cooked, killed, fried, baked, boiled, mashed, hashed, and seasoned, we don't get much of the original food that was in them when they were harvested. All right, what is to guide an individual in the question of good eating and drinking? Should we allow our appetites to be our rule in the way we eat? Isaiah 52 says, we should eat that which is good. Remember this, our appetite can be perverted and lead us to actually destroy ourselves. It is never a safe guide. Let's turn now to the Bible and see if there are, there are some rules given which might apply to this subject. It is interesting to, to note that the Bible records the original diet of man before sin entered the world. In Genesis 1.29 we read, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and every in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding herb and seed. 
So, God designed that man's menu should be fruits, grains, and nuts, and vegetables. This is somewhat different to that of modern man. Today, many eat whatever they want, however they want, and whenever they want. The world has swung far, far away from that perfect formula laid down by God. Rich pastries and animal protein, you will notice, were not even included in God's original diet for us. In fact, meat was never really allowed to human beings, apparently, until after the flood, at which time God permitted the use of certain clean animals for food. Now the reason for this extra provision becomes clear as we study the case more closely. Remember that Noah took the clean animals into the ark by sevens and the unclean by twos. Genesis 7 to 3. God had a purpose for this arrangement. After the water subsided, all vegetable matter, of course, had been destroyed. And God allowed the clean animals to be eaten for the first time. Perhaps you're wondering which animals are clean and which are unclean. Why did God make any distinction in them even back there in the days of Noah? Some people seem to think that only the Jews were to be careful about the food they ate. But the distinction between clean and unclean food goes all the way back to the flood before there were any Jews in existence. In Leviticus 11, 3-10, God listed the rules which govern the eating of flesh foods. Notice verses 3-7. to seven. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud, among the beasts that ye shall eat, nevertheless these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divided the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them ye shall ye eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and the rivers, of all that move in the waters, of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh. Now notice, friend, something very interesting. Those animals which are forbidden as food seem to be the very ones that Satan has created an appetite for today. The swine or pig, for example has been accepted in the world as good food, and yet God says not to eat it, not to touch it. I don't believe that we necessarily have to prove the scientific reasons for God's prohibitions in this matter. If God says it is unclean, I believe it, I accept it. But it's interesting to read what modern research has established about the hog. Pork contains a tiny microscopic worm called trichina, and if it gets into the system, the disease trichinosis results. Governments warn that there is no inspection for the parasites. Some have thought that thorough cooking of the meat might destroy the trichina parasite. But surely all these millions who have suffered the disease didn't eat their pork raw or half cooked. No, God knew what the body of man needed for food. But he said, don't eat the swine. Other animals also mentioned as unfit include the fish that don't have fins or scales. Now some may just ask why God made these unclean animals if they're not to be eaten at all. Well, the obvious answer is they serve the purpose of being scavengers on the earth. Take the buzzard. The eagle and the swine were made for the purpose of cleaning up the refuse of the earth. Again, let me remind you, friend, that these are not restrictions which originated with the, cer with the ceremonial ordinance of Moses. These were a part of that law, but clean and unclean animals were present in the ark hundreds of years before Moses even lived. Now let's read another text in Isaiah 66, 15-17. And this ought to settle it for us once and for all. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. 
For by fire and by sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the garden, behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. This text is talking about the second coming of Jesus and proves that the nature of those animals will not experience any change that will make them fit to eat, not even down to the very last day of this earth when Jesus comes. Friend, let us by God's saving grace determine to only eat foods that will honor God. This is Brent Winfield of the Advent Message Ministry letting you know that God loves you for he really, really does love you.